back and one day to go. I actually had a nap today. <laughs> I never nap, but I had to have when I was ready to fall over the past couple days. And uh, it's fun, you know, the adventure life is, is fun, but it's definitely physically taxing. You gotta take care of yourself. I gotta, I can be b bad to myself quite often because I just get carried away having fun. I don't give a shit and I get the attitude, you know, that you can sleep after you're dead, it's fine. But anyway, I'm babbling. I gotta get more emails heard. I'm behind a few days. Sun's going down. Fed myself, ate some leftover moose steak sandwiches. Really good. And uh, gonna be getting up at four o'clock in the morning and a friend of mine and I, this guy is basically what pe many people consider a true legend on the coast. First time I met him, I was 18 years old. I remember thinking, man, this is the coolest dude I've ever met in my life. Guiding for salmon and halibut, guiding for tuna, and then going down to Mexico and guiding for marlin and tuna in the wintertime, and guiding hunting. So I remember thinking, holy shit, this guy's got it going on. Anyway, numerous years later, here we are. His boats, I think, I don't know if you can see the boat over my shoulder or not. I can barely see the screen on his GoPro. And, uh, he asked me if I wanted to go tuna fishing tomorrow, and we're going. Should be good. I'm going to make a big video of it, too. It's 47 or 50 miles offshore one way. It's going to be an adventure, and then I finally get to go home after that. Finally get to go home. I've been away for a little too long this time. Anyways. Let's listen to what people want to share. This is titled My Stories. Steve, I've been listening to you for a couple years now. One of my favorite guiding stories he shared was the one where the shooter shot the grizzly that was chasing the moose. And the shooter turned and said, I smoked him. And the grizzly started growling and roaring. Oh, well, yeah, that was a crazy experience for me, man. I've never had an up-close and personal encounter with a sabbe like many have, but I have heard them. I also have a story and a picture that did happen with a separate subject you can share if you wish. I did share with David P., I'll be Dave Pilatus. Share if you wish. Only use my first name, please, and it's Corey. Gotcha, Corey. In 1986, I was at my grandparents' lake home. They lived on Baby Grand Lake in Twig or Saginaw, close to each other. Located roughly 30 minutes west, Miller Hill Mall in Duluth, Minnesota. Minnesota? Montana. I used to spend my summers there, one night at the kitchen table, window faces south. There was a light in the sky going over the lake, moving east to west. I don't remember what I said to my grandma, but we both saw it. I remember going outside with her and she bought, brought her camera. When the film got developed, this is the photo taken. When she showed me the picture, I was stunned. Not sure what it is, but it has a resemblance of some pictures others have taken of UFOs. This is the part that I can't figure out. My grandma insists I took the picture, but I swear she took the photo. The pic is getting worn, so I had it scanned at the print shop. Included is the original and blown up copy, 35 millimeter camera. Now, my boundary waters experience. Hold on a minute before we go in. Here's the picture right here. Am I right? I don't know if it's gonna work in the GoPro or not, but we're gonna try it, all right? I can't even see the screen right now. I hope that is working. That's an interesting picture. It looks like a little galaxy. Weird. <clears throat> All right. Now, my Boundary Waters experience. It's 2019 and we're on a dad-daughter trip with a couple other dad-daughters from church. We're in the BWCA, camping on Horseshoe Lake. It was getting dark, and I walked to the water's edge looking south and heard in the distance a long yell. It had to be a mile or so away, and it lasted for eight seconds. Later that same night, myself and another dad were talking around the campfire. There's another campsite across the lake from us, approximately 200 yards. The campers there had gotten back late to their site. We saw them paddle by 
and to their sight. They then turned on some music and assumed they, starting, they were starting dinner. It's kind of loud bouncing across the lake. Noises going on. I thought somebody was coming up behind me. Weird. Sorry. It was kind of loud bouncing across the lake. As we sat there staring at the fire, the sound of a large tree being pushed over to the left of the campsite across the lake. I turned to Eric, sitting next to me, and asked, Did you hear that? He said, Yes. I'm a coffee drinker, so the next morning I'm up early to get the coffee going. I looked across the lake, and the canoes, tents, were gone. Those campers left. Maybe they had other plans, who knows. Later that day, we went on a day trip south and paddled to Gaskin Lake. Looped back up and back to the Horseshoe Lake. Gaskin was about a mile or more south. As we paddled by another campsite, I wanted to ask the other campers if they heard anything. How could you ask? I did notice that there had been a big fire on the southwest end of Gaskin Lake. To that point, we were in to that point we were in South Dakota Custer National Park in 2021, and noticed there had been a fire there also around Mount Rushmore. The area is beautiful country. One more thing: Keystone, South Dakota, right next to Custer, has a Bigfoot festival every year. Google Google sighting in that part of South Dakota. Sorry, Google sighting in that part of South Dakota, and you'll get a bunch. If you if you ever read this or not, thank you for giving people a voice. Hope this helps anyone wanting to share. Corey, Corey, thanks, man. I'd imagine if a bunch of stuff has gone on around those lakes and where you were, and other people, including those campers may have seen or heard something, they're probably watching this right now, right? I'd imagine. And you might have just helped them out. And they're probably going to knee jerk, send in their experience as well. Possibly. Thanks again, man. Keep sending more. If you got shit that'll help the people, you send it. Send it in. Steve, I'm going to keep this short. You can call me Nay. No matter. In 67, I was 18 years old and volunteered to go on vacation in sunny Vietnam. The scared kept you alive over there, but I wasn't terrified. Terrified was yet to come. One of the three brothers, two years older than me, beat my ass as kids every chance he got. But now that changed. I forgave him, and we started coon hunting in the Ozarks together. About the third time going, we loaded the three tree and walkers, those are dogs, into the back of the truck and we went to the mountains. My brother didn't like guns after being accidentally shot and asked me to not take my Colt 44 mag handgun that night. Okay, I told him. I knew how he was about guns now. We got back there about 20 miles in the mountains and chucked them badass dogs, he said, out of my truck. And they were gone. We lit a smoke and I asked how long will it take for these badasses to tree? Well, 30 minutes had passed, and all of a sudden, these dogs were between our legs, tails under them. Well, that brought my attention. I either did or was going to say, what the hell, and then we heard it. I didn't know how to say Bigfoot, much less know about them. Something was walking around us from the direction the dogs came. My brother said, turn the light on and see. No shit. That damn thing is about 25 feet in the dark. Hell, I was already near to shit my pants. And if it looked like it sounded, I know. And if it looked like it sounded, I know I would have. You could tell by its breathing and walking all the way around us and a quarter mile back to the truck. I didn't need or want to see it. Well, years later, I found, I found out about the folk monster. I knew it would be going back in the mountains. And Larry, my brother, never asked me not to bring my guns. 
and I did smell about odor, but I believe that was my brother done shit himself. The smell was still with us. And if, and if have lied about any of this story, may all our kids be born naked. It's a true story. That's my story and I've stuck to it for 50 years. God bless you all and you be careful, Steve. Nay. There's another PS at the bottom. Steve, I got so fast I forgot to tell you this thing was walking on two feet as I was. He wasn't trying to hide anything from us. He sounded like an elephant walking on two feet. I don't think them badass dogs scared whatever it was a bit. But I know what breathing and bear growling sounds like, and a bear couldn't walk or and run that far to the truck. And we didn't have to let that tailgate and we didn't have to let the tailgate down from my brother's dogs. They were waiting on me and him in the truck. Maybe you can edit my forgetfulness in the story if you ever use it. But you be careful. Steve and God bless. Appreciate you, man. I get it. I get it. And you know as well as I do, I don't know how long you've been watching, listening to everybody speak here, but 100% of our experienced arms, armed forces veterans have all said that their experience with these things far, far outclassed the terror that they experienced in, in battle. And meanwhile, people go whooping and banging on trees in the night, right? Careful what you ask for out there. Careful what you ask for. You be safe out there too, man. I appreciate you taking your time out to, to get a hold of us. There's no, no shortage of boat sounds going on around me. I guess we are on the water, right? Listen to this. Personal counters and insight. Hey, Steve, thanks for your channel. I'm going to share some things with you. All I ask is that you keep my information personal. You'll understand once you get into the story. The stories that you have shared have helped me understand the things that I have experienced. My first encounter is back in 68. My grandparents had a cabin on the Trinity River in Trinity County, Willow Creek, California. That's a familiar area. I was 12 years old at the time and our grandparents used to take the grandkids for the summer. I have eight sisters and one brother. We also have three cousins, Jimmy, Mike, and Debbie. My grandfather had added onto the cabin, a covered porch, and a 25 by 30 concrete slab covered. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait a little bit and let this noisy ass outboard go by us, all right? And then I'll be back when he goes by. It's gonna get real loud. That was one noisy outboard. It's called an old seagull outboard. They're ancient Google mode. It's just a wide open exhaust. Sorry about that, now I'm back. Where were we? My grandfather had added onto the cabin a covered porch on a 25 by 30 concrete slab covered. No walls. He also made three large red redwood picnic tables where we ate our meals. This is where all of us kids used to sleep. My grandmother slept out there also. At about 2 a.m. we were all awakened by what sounded like a herd of elephants running around our cabin. There was whooping and jabber. We were all pretty scared at the time. We got out of our beds and huddled around our grandmother, who slept pretty much in the center of the slab. My grandfather was sleeping in the cabin. He came out with the 3030 and sat at the end of my grandmother's bed with all of his kids. At sunrise, he called our neighbors, who lived about a quarter mile away. A short time later, four, four grown men with rifles showed up. After talking for a couple of minutes, they all went out into the woods. About an hour later, they all came back in. At that point, we were allowed to go out in the woods, where the men had gone. There was a stand of young 10-12 to 12 foot Douglas firs, 4-6 to six inches across, that had been snapped 5-6 to six feet high. The ends of the trees were tied together, all pointing to a common tree in the center. None of us kids were allowed to play in the woods that year, for obvious reasons. Insight. A large group of women stayed together for a period of time. We all began to cycle at about the same time. Being a hunter, I used pheromones to lure my prey. I think this is what lured the man of the woods in. Footnote. My grandfather was a retired lieutenant commander, Coast Guard. He had earned the gold life-saving medal. 
He was a good character. There was a total of 15 people that had experienced all this. All would testify to the same. 1974, was 18, I was 18 years old, road hunting out of Happy Camp, California. Ran across a black bear that stood up and walked across a log road about 50 to 70 yards in front of us. It stood approximately 7 feet tall, black in color. It took him three strides to cross the road, then down over the embankment. On bear description, <clears throat> moving on to 1979, I've been working as an armed security agent and had an altercation with a drug cartel. Needless to say, my life became very complicated, and in order to keep my family and friends safe, I moved back to Northern California. Gold prices had moved from 30 bucks an ounce to 300, and I reasoned that I should be able to make a living gold mining. Back in 1980, I was working on an 8-inch suction dredge on the Trinity River. One night, we were sitting with our feet in the water, drinking a little whiskey and making animal calls. Somehow, we got stuck on a coyote call. We just could not get it right. When in the back of us, about 50 feet, there were three or four of them. They were laughing at us. Needless to say, we sobered right up. I developed a process, prospecting in which I would hike up ridge lines in wilderness areas, drop down into drainage systems, and prospect back to civilization. I would contract to prospect a drainage system that had not previously been mined. I would not have normally prospected this particular drainage system because it did not have the indicators. I brought two friends along with me, Scott and Gary. Gary had spent two years in Vietnam and was suffering from PTSD. We only found trace amounts of gold, not nearly enough to justify any mining operation. However, we did run across very large human footprints. The peat moss in the tracks were still springing back up when we came across them. Gary wanted to stay back in the drainage system to get his head straight. I tried to discourage him because of an eerie feeling I had. Everything was always dead quiet. No birds, no wildlife. Gary stayed behind only to show up at a friend's house a week later, totally freaked out. And this guy was a marine recon. He must have walked 20 to 30 miles to get to where he found us. Eventually, I eventually found a glory hole, which I worked for over four years. Keep in mind, this is, this is way out. 19 miles of paved logging road. 14 miles of unimproved road, and six miles of hiking. This area was known as the Golden Triangle. There's a lot of illegal pot growing going on in this area. Now I'm going to get a little off track, but it's necessary to understand the totality of what I'm trying to say. I left Trailhead late that morning, which is not a good idea. Heat and humidity. As I was humping up a trail that mid-afternoon, I ran across three individuals. They were armed and had drawn down on me. The fellow out front asked what the hell I was doing and that there were only two types of people up here, pot growers and thieves. And if you're not growing pot, you're a thief. At that time, I told him I could prove that I was a miner. I had a little gold pouch on my front belt loop, that I had some gold nuggets in the pouch and that my pack was full of mining tools. He allowed me to pull out a nugget from the pouch, which was a half an ounce or so, and I dropped it in the palm of an outreach hand. Keep in mind, he still had his firearm on me. As he turned to show the other two, I pulled up my 357 off my back, right hip, and leveled it between his eyes and the hammer cocked in the process. Needless to say, I got my nugget back, and I just told them to move on down the trail and not make any fast moves. He told me that there are a lot of growers up here and that he would get the word out. I told him, I don't care what you do on the mountain, I don't want to see you down in the creek. Now here's where it gets interesting. I'm down in the creek working, and this fellow is standing on a very large rock in the middle of the creek, hollering to camp. I signal him to come on in, and he introduces himself as Builder Bob. He explains to me that he's been elected to come down and talk to me. We had to lay out some ground rules. Come find out Builder Bob was Cherokee Indian, or so he said. I know this is getting long, but bear with me. Anyhow, throughout the course of the summer, Builder Bob would come by and visit, and he taught me how to catch fish with my bare hands. You ever wonder why a lot of people see the man in the woods and the creeks and rivers? I think they make fish traps. This is just my observation, but bear with me. You see, when I prospect, I have a gold pan with me. And that's not how I prospect. I prospect by getting in the water, floating face down, to read the rock. 
Now what these guys do is they will take a rock that is fairly flat and lift it up so that the rock is tilted nose toward the flow of water. Then put rocks on either side of the rock to keep it up. Then as, to steel, then as the steelhead or salmon are coming up creek, they will put their noses in the lee side of the rock. You can approach the rock and slowly put your hand in the water and you can feel the fish settle into your hand so you can pull them out of the water. Builder Bob showed me that and I use that system myself. The thing is, large rocks are not naturally laying that way. The other thing is, feces. I've run across various times what looks like human feces, crap in the water. The first time I saw this was at a campsite where two creeks had formed a large pool of water. I contributed to what I saw. I contributed what I saw to some disgusting individual that has nothing better to do with his time than crap in the water. Getting away for this boat to go by. I guess the sun's going down. There's gonna be a lot of boats coming by, isn't there? All right, here we go. I contribute to what I saw to some disgusting individual that has nothing better to do at this time than to crap in the water. But I've seen that before in areas that I know had no humans. The other thing is, what I saw in the water had to come from a very large creature. I know what you're thinking. I prospected my face in the water, and yes, what I'm telling you is the truth. I was face to face with a gigantic turd in the water. I think that maybe this could explain one of the reasons no feces is found in the woods. We know what black bear, deer, elk, and other creatures look like, but Sasquatch? I don't know. This is just a disgusting observation. After working a week to ten days, I had enough gold to buy some real equipment. I ran into a young lady and her girlfriend, and she had some mining equipment, and we agreed on a 60-40 to 40 split. Looking back, there are a lot of things that, I, that would not add up. First, this area is secluded in a wilderness area. I would... I would access my hotspot by a trail. The terrain was very steep, 70 degree angle. There was a game trail that went straight down off the mountain from the trail that was approximately three to four feet wide. Then along the creek bottom was a very large rock, eight feet high, 15 feet long, and about 10 feet thick. It was set on a piece of bedrock about two and a half above the water's edge. There was a small sandbar upstream from the boulder, which made a perfect little campsite. I constructed a little privy about 30 feet from the boulder downstream, made up of willows approximately 4 to 5 inches in diameter, stacking them up like logs on a cabin wall. I used an old coffee can to carry wood ash to the privy to keep the flies and odor down. One morning, I had my coffee and headed over to the privy to do my business. Somehow there was a, pr there was a paper wasp nest in the privy the size of a football. You should have seen a commotion of me trying to escape the wasps and my pants down around my ankles. No shit. The only place where the water was deep enough to get in and submerge was up by the big rock where the women were. Looked like they were doing jumping jacks trying to get me to go the other way. That night we started to get pelted by small rocks. The ladies were concerned, actually started freaking out. Small rocks began to get bigger. So I grabbed my shotgun, walked around the large rock that we were camped against, Right at that moment, a large rock about the size of a basketball smashed against the big rock where I had just come around. My first reaction was to yell like a drill sergeant, Knock that shit off! The response I got was a very loud growl, and then some jabber. Jabber that came just to the left of the growl. What I heard at the same time was, Leave him alone, he's not like the others. Then the big man whooped, and another whooped about 100 yards up the mountain. The ladies wanted to leave right then, and I explained that we had a six-mile hike through the wilderness before we ever got to the trailhead. Needless to say, the following morning, I gave them some gold and took them out of the country, never to be seen again. Now I set up two camps, one down by the creek where the big rock was, and one on the hillside with a southern exposure that would take the sunlight during the winter months. That fall in the upper camp, I was by myself and had been for a while. I was stoking the campfire that night and had made an earth lounge chair that I was sitting in when there was a very large shadow that walked across that edge of that I would refer to as the twilight. Not close enough to see, but close enough to detect or to see the shadow move. This thing had moved three strides and had covered approximately 15 feet. 
I grabbed my shotgun, stood up, and ran to the edge of the twilight. There, standing before me, was a very large, hairy man. Just standing there, looking at me, about four feet away. Holy shit. Four feet. It was like a standoff. We must have stood there for 10 or 15 minutes. That is like 16 lifetimes. I remember his eyes reflecting the light off the campfire. I finally said, peace be with you. Turned around and walked back to the campfire and sat down. Now, I've never experienced fear. In fact, just the opposite. I won't sleep in tent because they scare me. They offer no protection and I cannot see through the walls. I can relate. I just used a bedroll. I had to develop a mindset where I would say to myself, I am the best and deadliest mf -er out there and I mean no harm. I used to do that all the time too. From a young age, I used to do that. I've had a lot of animals in camp. They seem to sense that I mean no harm. I've never killed anything I did not intend to eat and I've never taken an animal out of my camp. I'm now 65. I've been married for 36 years. I have five grandchildren and 21 grandchildren. My grandchildren will marvel the way wild animals, birds, deer, and elk will come to me. I don't like doing that anymore because they lose the fear of humans, particularly the deer and elk. Some wahoo on an ATV will swing by and kill them. I think someone who would kill a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot has committed murder and are scum of the earth. I think these beings are intelligent, that they display a sense of humor and tolerance, and that, and that they have a sixth sense which I think we have lost. That they are family groups and are independent and are dependent on each other. I believe they have ranges that interlock with other family pods. I do believe they will show aggression when put out or offended. And that, for the most part, the aggression is a bluff. I also have no doubt they will kill if one of them has been hurt or murdered. Much the same way we would react if someone was to harm one of our family members. One more thing I feel I need to share. Remember, I told you I used to walk up ridge lines and drop down into the canyon and prospect my way out? One morning I woke up, put my pack together, and was wanting to prospect a particular canyon. As I was walking up the ridge, I came to a flat spot on a ridge line with a small creek on the right at the base of the sheer cliff. The ground was flat, but the roots of the trees had been exposed and almost looked polished. I started feeling really heavy, and it was everything that I could do to... I started feeling really heavy, and it was everything that I could do to throw out my bedroll and lay down. I went to sleep and woke up sometime later, hungrier than hell like I had not eaten in days. I returned to the base camp and decided I was going to resupply. This is where things really get strange. Usually at the end of the 10 days or so, I'd hook up with a good buddy of mine, resupply, and we would have beers. Well, he thought that I had left the country, or that I was dead in the backcountry, because he had not seen me for weeks. That's interesting. Well, that's my story. Share it if you will. We just ask that you keep my personal information out. I don't trust humans. You can call me Chuck. Okay, Chuck. Appreciate it, man. What a life you've been living. What a life you've been living. What a pile of experiences. Comes another boat. Give me a minute. All right, here we go. This is titled Something Big in Lake Tahoe. Hey, Steve, I'm glad to discover your channel. I love hearing all the different stories of encounters that your viewers share. It's been very educational, so I thank you for that. This story will be relatively brief and actually doesn't involve Sasquatch at all. Thankfully, I've never had an encounter with one of these beings, but I spent a few years living in South Lake Tahoe in the Sierra Nevada mountain range on the border of California and Nevada, and I did witness some strange things. Okay, man. Thanks for the kind words. Here we go. Strange lights on the top of a mountain one time and another on the 4th of July. One year I saw a light right on top of the water at night that I assumed was a boat but was dead silent and traveled all the way from one side of the lake to the other about 12 miles in under a minute. The story I want to share with you though happened on Lake Tahoe when I was very, while I was very far from shore in my kayak. I used to love 
to paddle up for 45 minutes to an hour to where the water was perfectly still and silent. Crack a beer or two and just relax and enjoy the scenery. One very calm and quiet day with no wind, I was doing this and I heard splashing. This sounded like a dog chasing a stick in shallow water. Only the water was over a thousand feet deep where I was at. I initially thought that it must be a large fish breaking the surface of the water, but when I looked, I was stunned to see a massive snake or serpentine-like animal no more than 60 feet away from me, just barely breaching the surface of the water. Because it was mostly submerged, it was difficult to gauge its size, but its diameter looked to be as large as a big tree, maybe five or six feet across, and looked exactly like the videos I've seen of the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. Not the ones where the head is out of the water looking like a dinosaur, but the ones where it just looks like a massive snake or anaconda just barely breaching the surface. That would make anybody shit themselves. Lake Tahoe has its own legend of a lake monster known as the Tahoe Tessie, but I was always just assumed this to be a myth. I still don't claim to know what I saw, but this thing was massive. I was in shock and awe when I saw it, and I wanted to grab my cell phone and film it, but I was frozen, just watching this thing pass me by and disappear into the distance. Then, not knowing where this thing was at, I started to panic and urgently started paddling back to shore, which was almost an hour away. That would have sucked. I tried to come up with a logical explanation for what I'd just seen and started researching large fish in Lake Tahoe. Sturgeon came to mind, but this thing was far bigger than any sturgeon. So I thought that maybe it was an optical illusion created by a large school of fish swimming in formation that resembled a serpent. Grasping for straws, I suppose, I could find any information of fish in Lake Tahoe that could do such a thing. It was definitely one animal, and it was absolutely huge. It's hard to estimate the length since it was mostly submerged, but it looked like it could have been anywhere from 25 to 60 feet long. Very impressive. I wish I could have seen more of it, and I'm kicking myself to this day for not getting it on film. My phone was inside a waterproof bag in the storage compartment of my kayak, and I would have had to have turned myself around to dig it out, and I didn't want to take my eyes off this thing for a second, because I was just dumbfounded by what I was seeing. No doubt, and I've kind of been there. Anyway, I know this isn't the kind of story people typically share on your channel, but I figured I would share it anyway, just in case one of your viewers have seen something similar. Maybe my account can reaffirm any sightings that anyone else may have had. And even if not, I think it's good to get these kinds of stories out to the people as well, so that we can all continue to find the missing pieces to this puzzle of life. Thanks, Steve, for what you do. Your honesty, integri integrity, and desire for the truth is really apparent. Your understanding of corruption on this planet is a breath of fresh air, since 90% of media and 100% of politicians cannot be trusted. I appreciate you creating a space where the voices of the people can be heard. We the people have all the power, but we must, excuse me, but we must collectively wake up to the facts so that we can take back our power and put an end to the senseless wars, flat currency, and transgenerational generational debt slavery. I'm actually writing a book about this currently. I feel a great awakening is on the horizon, and it humbles me to know how many peop people out there are starting to wake up. Anyway, have a great day, Steve. Keep empowering people and never give up hope. My name is Mike Wilson, and I don't care if you use my name. Sincerely, Mike Wilson. Mike, my man, thanks for sending that in, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. And uh, there has been a shit pile. You know, for the first time ever... As soon as I you described at first what you first were seeing was the I might I instantly thought I wonder if there is an actually maybe possibly an aquatic an aquatic version of portals. Hmm? Wouldn't that start to make a little bit of sense? I wonder. Not that I have looked into that ever or even thought of that in my entire life or heard of it, but you never know, right? Because we have that same flavor an, uh, animal or creature has been spotted off of Vancouver Island years ago. And for years, wrote about the newspaper. They called, they called, it, the, they called it the Cadborosaurus. 
and it was off of Cabro Bay. I remember that vividly. And I think I may have talked to somebody years ago that was seeing it too. And we also have another one being seen in um, in the Okanagan, Lake Okanagan, Okanagan Lake, called the Ogo Pogo. And that's been reported as being seen numerous times forever. And of course, one in Scotland, and you know, Lake Tahoe, right? And there's probably other ones. So, there's a little weird possibility to wonder about. Is there aquatic portals? Why wouldn't there be? Right? Maybe that explains something like that. I don't know. Interesting. Thanks for your bravery coming out, man. And now that you have, I'll bet you somebody else will too. That's how it works here, right? That's how it works here. You probably hear a bunch of voices. There's a couple of rental places just down from us. And it's always a big party there. Usually people rent it and party down. So it's starting to get loud. Fishing's over and everybody's telling their fish stories from the day and drinking beers. I'll see if we get one more up and then I'm going to bed. Got a big day tomorrow. Thanks again, man. Send in anything else if you get it that'll that'll help the people, all right? And let me know about your book. I'm very interested. Very interested. This is titled, I Saw It. Hi, Steve. I Saw It. I was living in Astoria, Oregon at the time. I was 13 and just gone to bed but not sleeping yet and I wasn't tired. My bedroom door was open a couple of inches, allowing some light into the, my room from the hallway. My sister's bedroom was on the other side of the hallway. All of a sudden, I heard a deep, gruff voice talking like it was angry. The words were indistinguishable, but indistinguishable, but it definitely sounded like sentences. My immediate thought was, why is dad so angry? Except it wasn't dad's voice. Then, suddenly, a tall, translucent, and shimmering human figure, much like the Predator movie, came gliding through my bedroom door, went across the room, and glided out through my window on the other side of my room. I was startled, but I didn't feel threatened. Later in life, that figure also reminded me of liquid mercury. I immediately got out of bed and went into my sister's room. Her bedroom door was wide open. I asked her if she had just heard or saw anything weird. She hadn't. So I thought to myself, that thing I had just seen must have only been taking talking to me somehow. So I then ran downstairs to ask my mom and dad if they heard or saw anything unusual, as they were still awake in the living room, and they had not either. I'm 49 now, and I've been trying all these years to figure out what it was that I heard and saw that particular night gliding through my bedroom. Thanks to you for listening. If you choose to read this to the How to Hunt Rod round table, I'm fine with you also sharing my name. Peace be with you, Amy Lucas. Amy, that story, as, well, as you well know, is a story that's going to make whatever percentage of the population go, yeah, right. But, fortunately for you, and unfortunately, un unfortunate in a way for many of us, because we got to have to face the fact that that's happening, it's, it's happened, that has been described from shit piles of people around the frickin' globe. Right? Who wakes up in the morning, decides, and says to themselves, Hmm, I wonder what I'm going to make up today. I know. Right? Said no one. I hope you find the answers. Right? I hope we find out the answers to that and more. I really want to find out all the solid 100% facts about four of my times up. I don't want to die. I just don't. We were talking about this the other day. I just do not want to die and find out, possibly find everything in there and then go, oh no, you're serious? Are you really serious? They were doing that to us the whole time? You know what I mean? I want to do it now and give everybody else on the planet a fair crack at living their life to the max bullshit free right so much bullshit to cut through and erase from from our existence anyway it's bedtime sun's down tomorrow's gonna be insane there's only two of us apparently you need three and it's gonna be i gotta run eight lines i think battling tuna all day long <laughs> for half the day we'll see what happens I'm going to make a video of it, so I'll share with you guys the highlights anyway. 
Hopefully. Hopefully I'm home tomorrow night. Finally. So keep emailing it in. Share my story at howtohunt.com. Email it in. Especially if it's going to help somebody. Alright?